Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Duff, Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my great honor to welcome you to the launch of the Society's new virtual lecture series on civic education and American democracy. Tonight's lecture is the first in the series, and we hope you can join us for each of them. Thomas Jefferson stated on many occasions that an educated citizenry is vital to our survival as a democracy. He wrote, for example, in a letter to his mentor and law professor, George Wythe on August 13th, 1786, that no other sure foundation can be devised for the preservation of freedom and happiness than the diffusion of knowledge among the people. Over 235 years later, we see this as a continuing challenge to preserving our freedoms in the United States. Threats to our constitutional form of government are both internal and external ones. These threats are perhaps even more complicated today because of increased methods of communication, which have been, as many technological advances often are, a mixed blessing. Misinformation, both inadvertent and intentional, can undermine public trust in our government and our way of life. We will be examining and addressing those challenges in this series of lectures. A critical element of the Supreme Court Historical Society's mission is to educate the public about the work, role, and independence of the Supreme Court of the United States, as well as that of the federal judiciary as a whole. Today, we have partnered with the Justice Anthony M. Kennedy Library and Learning Center at the Sacramento, Fe Sacramento Federal Judicial Library and Learning Center Foundation to bring you this lecture. We thank Chief Judge Kim Mueller of the Eastern District of California for coordinating with us. We are also joined by teachers and alumni of the Society's Summer Institute for Teachers, as well as members of the Society. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight's lecture is from Suzanne Spaulding. I've heard Suzanne speak at many of our federal court circuit conferences and other venues about her topic tonight, and it is eye-opening. The president of our historical society, Chilton Varner, who also joins us tonight, recently heard Suzanne speak and she called me and she said, we have to ask Suzanne to speak to society. And I couldn't agree more. She is senior advisor for Homeland Security and the director of Defending Democ Democratic Institutions Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She also served as a member of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Previously, she served as undersecretary for the Department of Homeland Security, where she led the National Protection and Programs Directorate now called Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. She is currently on the board of directors for defending digital campaigns and for girls security and on advisory boards for Nozomi Net Networks, Splunk, MITRE, Harvard University's Defending Digital Democracy Project, Foundation for Defense of Democracies and Technology Law and Security Program at American University. She is a member of the Homeland Security Experts Group, sits on the Council of Executives for the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at Auburn University, and is on the faculty of the National Association of Corporate Directors. If this were a court proceeding tonight, I am quite certain that Suzanne would qualify as an expert witness. <laughs> Suzanne is certainly the expert on the subject of the dangers of foreign influence on our independent judiciary. And we are absolutely delighted to have her join us on our virtual platform this evening. She'll speak for about 35 to 40 minutes and then we will take questions from the audience. And I would ask you to please submit your questions in advance in the Q&A window of Zoom. And we'll get to as many of those as we can. With that, uh, Suzanne, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you for joining us tonight. 
Jim, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and I'm so grateful uh, for your invitation and, and for the work that you're doing that you did at the uh, Administrative Office of the Courts where we first met and that you're doing now. And, uh, and of course, to the uh, Justice Kennedy uh, uh, Institute as well. Um, and really everyone who is tuning in tonight, thank you for your interest in this really vital subject. And I'm thrilled to be launching this important lecture series. Um, what I wanna talk with you about tonight is the work that I've been doing at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a national security think tank here in Washington, DC. Um, since I left the Department of Homeland Security um, in uh, January of 2017, but it started by interest in, 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 in looking at these issues, of course, started when I was at DHS and particularly in 2016. While I was at DHS, I led the group of men and women who uh, worried about securing our critical infrastructure in this country. And in 2016, that very much included our election infrastructure, as you know. And uh, we were very focused on trying to protect our elections. And what, of course, what we wound up seeing, we, look, we were looking very carefully for and defending against traditional malicious cyber activity. Um, and what we saw was uh, malicious cyber activity that was ultimately used to fuel an information operation and disinformation uh, in that campaign. And when I got out in 2017, I, I was very mindful of what our intelligence community had told me while I was in uh, at DHS and subsequently put in a public report that what we saw in 2016 from Russia in terms of information operations around the election was really just part of a broader campaign to undermine public trust in democracy and our democratic institutions. And, uh, and so that is what the work that I began to uh, embark upon at CSIS was looking at what did that mean um, I, I came out of the intelligence community. That's where I spent much of my career. And in the intelligence community, we do something called red teaming, where you put yourself, try to put yourself in your adversary's mind and figure out what they might do, what they might do next. So I tried that. I tried putting myself in Putin's mind. And I thought if I were, if my goal was to undermine public confidence in democracy and democratic institutions writ large, where would I go next? And I thought about what other institution is like elections so dependent upon public trust and confidence in the legitimacy of its process for the American public to expect to respect the legitimacy of the outcome. And I'm trained as a lawyer, I went to law school, spent a number of years practicing law and I immediately thought about our justice system and how dependent it is on public faith and confidence in its independence and impartiality and in its competence. And I thought about how easy it would be uh, really to undermine that confidence. And, uh, and so that's what we started looking at. And I really thought we were getting out ahead of something uh, because we hadn't, I hadn't heard anything about Russia going after trust in the justice system. And I, but I thought it made sense that he might go there next. But as we started looking, we found lots of evidence. So I thought what I would do tonight and the, the, what Jim has heard in the past is talk with you about the evidence that we did find um, of Russian information operations targeting public trust in our justice system. And then I wanna to talk to you about why what, all of, what so many of you on this uh, uh, call are engaged in, which is, reinvigorating civics education in this country, um, reinvigorating civic literacy among our entire population, uh, and, a, and an understanding of the value of democracy. So uh, well, I'll start. Uh, my very able colleague, uh, co-researcher and co-writer of our reports, Davy Nair, is going to operate the slides for me. Uh, Davy, next slide. So I always like to start by making some really important points right up front. So the work that I focused have focused on primarily, at least for the first two or three years 
uh, out of DHS was on Russian information operations. And this is in part, of course, because that's that was the primary player in the 2016 election uh, in terms of adversary information operations, um, but also because Russia is generally the most uh, active adversary in uh, democracy undermining information operations. But having said that, it's important to note and to acknowledge that Russia is not the only nation state engaged in information operations. Certainly China has robust information operations with slightly different objectives. Uh, and other countries are increasingly getting engaged in information operations. Moreover, Russia increasingly is amplifying domestic voices. Uh, and there are domestic voices that have nothing to do with Russia that are also uh, uh, heavily engaged in information operations in, in spreading disinformation and misinformation. So I, you know, it's important to acknowledge that up front, even though most of my break briefing is gonna focus on our work with respect to uh, Russia's information operations. Second is that uh, these information operations exploit weaknesses of our own making. Um, they, they really pick up on vulnerabilities that pre-exist their information operation campaigns and exploit those um, in ways that we'll talk about. The, the most important point is that I'm gonna talk about the ways in which Russian propaganda um, talk, uh, undermines public trust in the independence and impartiality of our justice system. It is important to emphasize that what we, are, what we are concerned about here is not criticism of the court system. My friends who are justice reform advocates are patriots. They are trying to make the institution stronger, to hold our institutions accountable for living up to our aspirations in order to make our country stronger. That is not Putin's objective. Next slide. So as we started looking for, you know, was there any evidence of Russian uh, efforts to undermine trust in the justice system? One of the first things we came across was this amazing story in Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, there was a story running rampant on social media uh, that a five-year-old girl had been raped at knife point by two Syrian refugees who were later seen high-fiving their dads. Horrific story. But it pretty quickly became clear, the authorities took these two young boys who were found in a basement of an apartment building with a young girl into custody um, and investigated what had happened. Uh, very quickly determined there was uh, no rape, there were, they were, there were no Syrian refugees involved, there was no knife and there were no high-fiving of the deaths. But uh, actors on social media had added these embellishments, these false, this false information in order to heighten the emotional resonance of this story and to play into a narrative that the local pol politicians were soft on immigration, were soft on refugees which is one of the narratives that Russia pushes. And, and while the uh, chief of police came out to correct the, uh, to, to note that all those facts were false um, and other local officials tried to correct the story, social media would not let go of this story. Next slide. This is one of the Facebook posts. This is in July, this is in the summer of 2016 that this is happening. This is a Facebook post trying to get people out into the streets. There had been a similar incident in Germany in January of 2016, where Russian media had picked up on a false story of an alleged rape by refugees. And they had succeeded in turning thousands of people out into the streets all across Germany, railing against the prosecutor and the courts and officials for failing to prosecute a crime that never happened. Here we see in Twin Falls, Idaho, in August of 2016, an effort to turn citizens out for a rally, for a protest, to throw these officials out of office, 
to go after the prosecutor and the judge for failing to go after these Syrian refugees, which of course was a false, was disinformation. Um, and what's really important to note here is that Secured Borders, the group that's putting out this Facebook post, is not a group of concerned Twin Falls, Idaho citizens, but a fake affiliation affinity group created by the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. The group that we have all now read so much about, the troll factory that the Kremlin had set up uh, to promote disinformation inside the United States. Um, and here they were in Twin Falls, Idaho, pretending to be concerned Americans, trying to turn people out into the streets uh, with a message that the justice system favors refugees over citizens. Next slide. These are a couple of the tweets that were uh, flying around on social media about three Syrian refugees raping a girl at knife point. Um, a, another one going after Wendy Olson, who was the a federal prosecutor in, uh, in Idaho, who was asking people to stop spreading the false information. Red LA News, the author of the first tweet and Patriot Raphael, the author of the second tweet, again, fake accounts set up by the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. Spreading this message that the justice system is irrevocably broken. Next slide. But it's not just uh, online social media. It's also Russian propaganda. And this is a program that's on every week on RT, which of course stands for Russia Today, called America's Lawyer. It's hosted by an American trial attorney named Mike Papantonio down in Florida. And this is a typical uh, in, uh, uh, introduction to what he talks about every week on his show. To say that the justice system in the United States is broken would be a gross understatement. Corporations and corrupt politicians have taken control, turning the once impartial judiciary into a tool for the elite to use for their own gain. The message that these, uh, the, the, these propaganda outlets and these fake accounts and this information operation campaign are pushing is not just that we have a flawed system that needs to be reformed, but that the system is irrevocably broken. And the idea is to get Americans to give up just as the attack on truth is, is, in, is designed to get Americans to give up on the idea of being informed, they, the message that the system is irrevocably broken is designed to get Americans to disengage, to either take to the streets in anger rather than in an effort to bring about uh, accountability or change, or to disengage altogether. And then we are robbed of the informed and engaged citizenry upon which a democracy depends. Next slide. The narrative frames that we found looking at 17 million tweets and many, many Facebook posts, uh, all of which the platforms had traced to Russian uh, inauthentic accounts, um, fell into four broad categories but all of them go to challenging the independence and impartiality of our justice system. So their narrative frames that they push in their propaganda are one, that the justice system tolerates and covers up crimes by immigrants and refugees, which we've talked about. And we, we've seen it in many contexts where they have uh, weighed in, uh, particularly around criminal cases, um, that the justice system operationalizes the institutionally racist and corrupt police state, the narrative that America is a racist country is one that Russia has pushed for many decades. Uh, again, these are all narratives that find some uh, traction by preying upon legitimate grievances and weaknesses of our own making. The justice system directly supports and enables corrupt corporations. That is the primary theme of America's lawyer on RT and that the justice system is a tool of the political elite, which is another very common narrative frame. Next slide. 
They also use these narrative frames and, and their attacks on the justice system to exacerbate divisions in this country. And they use divisions in this country to exacerbate mistrust of the justice system. So they are mutually reinforcing these tactics and objectives. And we see it, uh, you know, around, for example, the race issue. While Russia has overtly accused the United States of being a racist country, um, and, and irrevocably so, uh, for many, many decades, um, we, we also see them weighing in on the other side, uh, if they see an opportunity to create division. So here we see a Facebook page from a group called Black around the uh, sh fatal shooting of Alton Sterling, a black man um, by uh, police officers. But five days later, uh, Heart of Texas is sharing a, uh, is promoting an event. Heart of Texas, again, fake account coming out of Russia, promoting a Black Lives Matter event. Um, tr again, trying to exacerbate the divisions. We saw the same thing in the immigration context where they tried to turn people out on both sides of the immigration debate to a rally in the hopes of stirring uh, uh, further uh, uh, conflict and violence. Next slide. So these are the reports that we did detailing the evidence that we saw uh, and the, uh, the reasons we saw behind um, Putin's and Russia's attacks on democracy and democratic institutions. And then a, the deep dive that we did on the attacks on the justice system. Um, and uh, so there's lots more of the uh, evidence that we found in these reports. But both reports came out with uh, very similar recommendations. Next slide. We need to raise awareness uh, about this threat, that, that we have an adversary whose intention is to weaken us, not to strengthen us, not to help hold our institutions accountable, but simply to get us to give up on these institutions and lose faith in democracy. Um, we need to understand that better. Uh, we need to promote bipartisan action to prevent and deter foreign interference. This cannot be a partisan issue. The attacks come from both sides. Uh, that Russia, as I said, plays both sides of these issues. Um, and we need to understand it as an attack on democracy, not an attack on one party or a candidate or another. We need to improve our rapid response capabilities and communication capabilities between our institutions and with the public so that uh, we're all familiar with the, with the uh, adage that was attributed to Mark Twain that a lie can make its way halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. Um, and we need a rapid response if we're going to, um, as one of the tools that we need to use to address these disinformation campaigns. But ultimately, perhaps our most important recommendation was that we need to build public resilience against this messaging that democracy is irrevocably broken, that it is a fundamentally broken system, right? And that our justice system as one of those pillars of democracy and a democratic institution is irrevocably broken. We need to build public resilience against the content, not just build uh, uh, digital literacy um, and, uh, and not just work with the platforms to identify inauthentic accounts. All those things are important, but ultimately disinformation is gonna make its way through uh, and we are all gonna be confronted with it. And we need to have public resilience against that messaging. And the best way to do that is through civic education. And this is why we talk about civic education as a national security imperative, not just something that is uh, nice to have, but that is absolutely fundamental and essential to sustaining our democracy. Next slide, please. We all know uh, that the, we, we, uh, the state of civics in this country is, uh, is not good to put it mildly. 
The National Assessment of Educational Progress results showed that only 24% of eighth graders nationwide tested as proficient in civics. And really, it's no surprise, and those of you who are teachers know this better than I, um, we have just not prioritized the teaching of civics education adequately in this country. The federal government, for example, spends on average $54 per student on STEM education, and this is largely in the wake of Sputnik, right, and our, and our concern about the importance of STEM education, um, and only five cents per student on civics education. We think it's time that we recognize that civics as, is as important to our national security as STEM education is. Uh, most troubling, I'm sure you're all familiar with the most recent poll results, uh, poll and polls and surveys that show uh, that Americans are resorting, think that a resort to um, violent action may be justified. 34% of respondents said that it might be justified for citizens to take violent action against the government. And again, I think this is a reflection of a sense that the system is broken and a lack of understanding about constitutional means for addressing the shortcomings of our system, right? So democracy has often failed, is now failing to meet the needs of many Americans. Our justice system is flawed. Racism does exist significant, to a significant degree in parts of our justice system. These are all legitimate concerns. It is often difficult for, a, a, for the little guy, if you will, um, to be able to muster as much power uh, in the justice system as a large corporation, for example. But what Americans need to understand is all of the mechanisms that are currently in place to hold our judges and our courts accountable, all of the organizations and entities and individuals that are currently working to do that, and the means by which they are doing so, right? Understanding not just that there are three branches of government, but what is the role and function of those three branches of government? Why are there three branches of government? And what are our aspirations for them? How are they supposed to function? And importantly, what are the mechanisms for holding them accountable? We, we need to empower Americans to be agents of change. The beauty of democracy is not its perfection. It is not perfect. The beauty of democracy is its capacity for change. Unlike authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, democracy is susceptible to change, but only if we are those agents of change. If we are informed and engaged enough to bring about the change that we, that we seek in order to move us toward that more perfect union. This is why I put my hope in the reinvigoration of civics education, why I think that is so important and why I think that our failure to have done so contributes so significantly to the problems we see today. Next slide, please. Uh, Davey and I uh, wrote a number of papers around restoring trust in our national security institutions. And, and there again, we talked about the importance of civics education uh, as, as we, in the run up to the election of 2020, I became increasingly concerned as I saw what was happening in our courts with the convergence of COVID and our elections and, and uh, dis, uh, election officials and state officials making decisions about how to carry out an election in a time of COVID and that those decisions were being challenged in court. So you take a very inherently divisive and partisan issue, the elections, and an increasingly partisan issue, COVID, you bring those together and you put them in front of the courts at a time when there is this concerted effort, at least coming out of Russia, 
to undermine public trust in the legitimacy of our courts. And I, and I saw a recipe for disaster, that as the courts ruled on these cases, there would be an inevitable temptation for the losing party to conclude that the court had acted in a way that was political, that was, that was not based on law, but based on the judge's preferred outcome. And, uh, and we were doing training. What we've been doing over the last uh, two and a half years, two to three years, is training federal judges and state judges and their teams on this threat from disinformation, undermining public trust in the courts and how they can detect it and the things that they can and must do to restore the public's confidence in our justice system, including higher levels of transparency, uh, making sure that they are clearly explaining their cases uh, and, and, how, and explaining how they are relying on the law. And that much of this needs to be put out early before the case comes to the court. So we are now engaging in this again in the run up to the next rounds of elections that courts need to be posting right now. What, how do these election related cases come before them? And, and how do the courts look at them in a generic sense, not in, the, in a specific case? So basic things, what's a preliminary injunction, right? Uh, what's a TRO? Um, so that there are authoritative sources to point to, but that they also need to think about having voices in their communities who can talk about and set the record straight if false information is being put out and that they need to strive always to live up to our aspirations. Next slide, please. So the good news here is that we are not alone, of course, in believing that civics is critically important to meeting the challenges that we face. So the Inspired to Serve report was the report of a commission on public service looking at how do we get more people to, to uh, be willing to serve in the military and in civilian public service roles at every level. And they did not intend when they started out to talk about civics, but as they got into the, the, their discussions and talking to more and more experts and we provided testimony, they realized that civics education was a fundamentally important part of uh, reinstilling a sense uh, among the among our population of the value of public service, right? And and civics and public service and, and and community service are ways in which we rediscover some of our most fundamental shared values, which is the only way we're going to be able to begin to bridge the divisions in our country. I firmly believe that if you spend the day picking up trash along the side of the highway with someone. And at the end of the day, you find out that they voted for the other guy. Uh, it's much harder to demonize them. Uh, and so this notion of civic responsibility, of civic engagement as part of what we need to reinvigorate in our country, uh, I think it's fundamentally important way of, of, of bridging the divides. Jim mentioned I'm on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, our report also about cybersecurity and deterrence and our adversary nations and building resilience in our IT networks, et cetera. But as we talked about, particularly in the context of our election security, there was a recognition among all the commissioners that civics education was critical. It's a critical for all the reasons that I've talked about um, in, in uh, securing our democracy. It is critical in instilling that sense of civic responsibility that uh, causes, promotes all of us to, to have better cybersecurity practices because we, are, we understand the role that we can play in not only you know, the, the corruption of our own system and our own data, but of the systems, networks and data of our communities and of our country. So two reports that didn't seem to have anything to do with civics that came out with very strong civics recommendations. The Solarium subsequently, its final act before going out of its official existence and transitioning to, um, to a think tank was to write a white paper on disinformation 
that is very heavy on recommendations around reinvigorating civics education in this country. And that is a very bipartisan uh, uh, panel that Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So um, again, a, a bipartisan issue. Next slide, please. Frank Lutz, Lutz who's a Republican pollster, uh, did a survey, uh, asked uh, respondents um, about what was the best way, most productive, positive and meaningful impact on strengthening America's American identity. And of all of the things, national service and um, easier access to voting and more participation in religious activities, all these things, the top, uh, the number one choice for respondents overwhelmingly and interestingly on a bipartisan basis was civic education for students in K through 12. Uh, almost a, a, an identical percentage of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, there's almost no other issue in this country that you could survey on that would get an equal number of Democrats and Republicans responding in the same way. Um, Congress has introduced legislation to reinvigorate civics on a bipartisan basis in the House and the Senate with a Republican and Democratic uh, primary sponsor in both houses. Next slide. We have been engaged in a online dialogue, civics as a national security imperative. Uh, we've had a wonderful uh, slate of, of folks that I've had the privilege of, of interviewing, of having fireside chats with, conversations um, all across the aisle from government, current government, former government, and the private sector, Brad Smith, uh, uh, President of Microsoft, uh, Bob Gates, former Secretary of Defense, Jay Johnson, my former boss at the Department of Homeland Security, Christopher Wray, and so many others, military flag officers and national security lawyers, and two Supreme Court justices, Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Neil Gorsuch, two people who agree on very little but who not only agreed on the importance of civic education, but modeled civic civil discourse in a hour long conversation with me and my colleague, Jamil Jafir. So for, particularly for the teachers out there, I really encourage you to uh, take a look at these videos. Uh, we know that a number of teachers, particularly the one with the Supreme Court justices, show this to their classes. Uh, and, uh, and there really are some very powerful insights from these folks. Next slide. So uh, we've been focused primarily on promoting K through 12 uh, because we think that's such a critical investment, but because it's a national security imperative, part of what we're trying to convey with that language is a sense of urgency. We need to improve civic literacy today. Yes, we need the long-term investment in K through 12, but we need to improve civic literacy across the adult population as well. And so we are just about to embark on a project that we call Civics at Work, where we are encouraging corporate leaders to sign on to a statement indicating how the, their uh, commitment to supporting the reinvigoration of civics education, calling on Washington and government at state and local levels to prioritize civics education, but also committing to do their own work on civic education by having internal conversations with their workforce. We wanna reach the adult population through their places of employment, through their work, workplaces. And so we wanna provide resources from civics experts all across the country to help employers have civic have civil civic literacy conversations with their workforces, starting with talking about um, civil discourse and the importance of civil discourse. And then to engage in activities in their communities to promote civics and support civics education in their communities. So that's the, the will be our main thrust in the coming year. Uh, and we're just getting that underway, but very excited about it. And I think that's it. Davey, any more slides? Oh, yes, of course. So this being the Supreme Court Historical Society event, um, we have had tremendous support from the courts at every level uh, from the beginning of this project, including from Jeff Muneer, who is the counsel, counselor to the Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts. 
um, who's who came to one of our very very first events and has been a uh, you know really given us some good guidance. Um, and the Chief Justice in his 2019 year end report focused primarily on disinformation and the threat of disinformation. And I, again, I commend it to you. He starts with a really interesting history lesson, um, reminding us that disinformation goes back to the, to the founding of our nation, the very earliest stages. Uh, but this, you know, he, he talked about in the year end report about how we've come to take democracy for granted, right? that civic education has fallen by the wayside. He said, in our age when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides is ever more vital. And he noted that the judiciary has an important role to play in civic education. And I would simply note that in, uh, in the last several years in working with judges and courts across this country, I it is clear to me that the judges take this role very seriously. And I know that uh, Chief Justice Mueller is very much involved in civics education as are her colleagues at the state and federal level all across the country. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just very grateful for that. And so I will end where I started just to say thank you to all of you for what you're doing. And I welcome your questions and hope we can have a, a good discussion. I hope I've provoked some no, don't feel don't feel shy about challenging things that I said. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, it's enlightening, and uh, I hope uh, inspiring. Uh, it certainly has inspired me over the years to hear you. And as we um, look for questions from the audience, if you have questions, please type them into the Q and A section, and we'll get to as many as those as possible. Um, we've been at this a, 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 for a number of years now, uh, not an uh, overwhelming number, but enough that I'm, um, the question I will lead off with is, have you seen some uh, reason for encouragement or improvement in civics education in our schools? And it fell out of the curriculum in most schools because um, they taught to the uh, admissions tests uh, in the high schools around the country and civics is not on admissions exams and uh, uh, for the most part. And so it fell out of the curriculum. And uh, have you seen any progress in getting it back into the curricula? And you, you admit there are so many nuggets in your remarks that I would pick up on and, and following up on that question, but I'll let you get to that one first. Yes, well, there are some encouraging signs. There are some discouraging signs that, as we've all, as we all know as well. But the encouraging sign is um, that uh, I believe, and Davey, you feel free to correct me if I've got this wrong, but I, my, I believe that at least eight states over the last year or two have enacted legislation that require at least one year of civic education uh, before graduating from high school, I think is is uh, generally how those go, and and that is that is thanks to tireless work at the state and local level, as well as work by groups like iCivics um, that have uh, been very engaged in trying to make that happen. So that's been encouraging, and 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 we've seen some wonderful pilot projects. We do see this bipartisan support in Congress, although it's hard to get anything through there. The discouraging piece, of course, is, is how quickly everything, even that when things start out and should be bipartisan, become politicized. And, um, and so I, you know, I do worry about a lot of the fights and, and, and uh, heated rhetoric and threats of violence that we see um, around curriculum and school boards all across the country and threats against uh, uh, school board officials, for example. And, um, so that's that's quite concerning. You, you mentioned uh, that the, uh, the educating people about the law in civics and civics education generally didn't go into that kind of detail. As I uh, uh, look back on my own uh, education when I was in uh, high school, um, but there really is a need, it seems to me, to uh, as, as you pointed out, educate uh, 
the, the citizenry about the fundamentals of law. And unfortunately, in our society, it's only lawyers who get trained in that and who understand how the court system works. Uh, are, are you aware of any efforts to take some of that uh, legal training, if you will, into the high school? So to, just to educate people about the fundamentals of how courts work, how they get their cases, what injunctions are, uh, just enough to understand the process and procedure of our courts, which I think is crucial to understanding uh, the balance of, of powers in our um, uh, system. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree, Jim. Not, not The balance of powers which is critically important, um, but also how individuals can use the court system, right, to... Right. to protect their rights. Uh, this is one of the main reasons I, I think the business community uh, should care deeply about civics education and preserving the rule of law because they depend on those courts uh, to enforce their rights, their contracts, et cetera. And so critically important. So there are some really interesting things that are happening. I, you know, anecdotal, anecdotally, my uh, nephew who lives in Towson, Maryland, is part of in his uh, in high school is part of a program um, that includes law. Um, I don't remember the name of the full program, but they are they are teaching these high school kids about law. Um, more of what I'm familiar with and have seen uh, across the country are courts that are that are having students come into their courtroom. They're doing mock trials. Um, they are, you know, where the, the students are, are the jury or they are the prosecutor or the defender or the judge, um, uh, you know, they, and judges that are going into high schools and talking with high school students about the role of rule of law and the role of courts and our legal system. Um, so I, so I, but those are, you know, ad hoc uh, and they need to be institutionalized and they need to be regularized. I, and I totally agree. I think, um, Interestingly, uh, iCivics has come out with the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap. They, uh, it's a bipartisan document that talks about how we should think about reinvigorating civics education. It does not talk about what the content of that should be. That's a state and local issue. But it does talk about the kinds of topics that should be covered. Um, I think it's critically important that our public servants, for example, also in addition to our high school kids, uh, again, to adult education, I think it's critically important that our public servants understand um, not just what the law is that they're supposed to follow, but why. Why are those laws there? Right. For the military to understand why do we have policies about military being apolitical? Why do we have laws around limiting domestic use of the military? Not just that we have posse comitatus, but why? Hmm. How do you uh, view the media's role in this? You, you, I think, did a very good job of pointing out bipartisan issues, issues on that each party have seemed seem to have um, seized on, but uh, disinformation keeps. It's fueling a lot of what you point out uh, are, are real problems that we have, but they uh, uh, exploit and take advantage of those problems and um, you know elevate them to a, a point of of frictions uh, to debilitate uh, our, our form of government rather than inform it and and uh, inspire it for action. What role do you see the media playing in that? And is what more can we do about um, getting uh, nonpartisan media reports? Yeah, well, the, the role of the media is so fundamentally important. You know, and the media, of course, is also being attacked uh, because that's part of the attack on the whole notion of being informed. And, and of, of any idea of truth. You know, Mike Hayden who was the former head of, it, of NSA talks about, you know, our movement toward a post-truth world. That's the world that Putin has created in Russia where his population just shrugs its shoulders at the, that, you know, that of course it's all lies, you know, and it's just taken for granted now. They've given up on the idea of truth and that's where he wants to get us 
is to the point where we give up on the idea of truth. And, the, and so um, undermining public trust in the media is an important part of that. But again, picking up on weaknesses of our own making. Uh, I, I trace it back fundamentally to, uh, to cable news. Um, I think when, when uh, network broadcast uh, uh, stations had an obligation, a legal obligation, because they got uh, spectrum for free to be able to broadcast into our homes, whatever you know, commercial shows they wanted to broadcast, that came with strings. And that was that they had to provide at least a half an hour of news every day. So it was not a, it was not a profit center. It was something they had to do, whether it made money or it didn't make money. It was just a legal obligation. And, and that's, those were the golden years of, you know, of, of trusted media, I think. Um, once it became about making money, once it became a much more around profits, um, you know, they quickly realized what those on social media realized, which is that emotion sells. Right, right. Oh, very good points. Um, question uh, from the audience. And, and in addition to the materials you suggested proactively posting on court websites, do you have other examples of best practices undertaken uh, by courts who improved their rapid response and communication capabilities? And, and this harkens back to your uh, suggestion that courts need to get ahead of uh, issues to the best that they can. And that's a, that is a challenge for courts because the courts do react and not uh, uh, act in advance of cases brought to them. But uh, uh, do you have examples? And often, don't even, and often don't even react, right? They don't no, even want to right. react. Uh, yep. the, and I understand all of that, and it's an important part of preserving the integrity of the of the, of the court. Uh, the case speaks for itself, right? You don't, right. You don't make comments outside of the written decision, um, and, and that sort of thing. I, I I get all of that, and we've talked we've talked with the courts and the judges about that, and ways to address that, to 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 hold to that important um, piece of integrity for the courts while still not giving disinformation free reign. Mm -hmm. And so having these outside validators is, is or outside uh, validators isn't quite the right word, but fact check, uh, fact providers, right? Authoritative voices that, that when a, when a inaccurate, not again, not just criticism of the court, but an in, when inaccurate information is being put out that they can stand up and correct the record. Um, so that uh, again, a judge doesn't necessarily have to be in that position. And I will tell you one of the courts that's most out front on these issues is Arizona, the Arizona State Court. They set up a task force. We did a, a briefing uh, two, at least two years ago, maybe closer to three now. Um, and the and we had folks from the Arizona from Arizona in the in the briefing and the and the uh, workshop, and they went back and set up a task force on disinformation. Um, and came out with a whole set of recommendations for the court and um, made changes. And, and so that's one place I would look is the Arizona State Court. The National Center for State Courts has been an outstanding partner for us from day one. Uh, Mary McQueen um, has just you know, got this issue immediately, understood it, and has been talking with her members about it for years now and, and working with them, not just, you know, and, and so sh we have partnered on this training for state courts. So that's a great resource for anyone who wants to find out more about what the state courts are doing on this and where you might find resources. They've, they've done a, a good bit um, on, on, on that front. Right. And I right. just want to add, add Jim, the, the one thing I wanted to go back to your media question. The other point I, I really want to emphasize is the importance of local media. Mm -hmm. Survey after survey show that local media is more trusted than national media. Interesting. And, um, and sadly, Russia understands this and has been impersonating and spoofing local media to push its disinformation. Um, but it's really important, I think, that we support local media. Oh, that's, that's very good uh, and very helpful. If you had to recommend one or two books for adults to read to better understand the constitution and our political and legal system, uh, what might they be? 
So um, I, I, I love Tim, Timothy Snyder. Timothy, I think his middle initial is D, um, who wrote On Tyranny. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's got, for those of you who, who are like me, the pile of books that you want to read is um, higher than your bed uh, at your bedside. <laughs> and so you want something shorter. If you want to get a sense of Timothy Snyder, you can find a very brief, like two and a half page essay or list actually of 20 key principles from On Tyranny. And this is my favorite. He talks about, he says, defend an institution. Follow the courts or the media or a court or a newspaper. Do not speak of our institutions unless you are making them yours by acting on their behalf. And he goes on to talk about how institutions don't protect themselves. We do that. Um, uh, so I would highly recommend um, that. And then if you're really interested in, in uh, disinformation, Peter uh, Pomorozov, uh, anything by him is is very good, um, and um, yeah. And I, I I will send around my I'm I'm blanking at the moment. Yeah, on, no, that, that's that's on, fine. That's on good. Wonderful uh, things that are out there that have been written about about uh, you know how the dangers that democracy are in and how we need to strengthen it. But there's some great stuff that has just come out really in the last few months. Um, and I can get it to you, Jim, and maybe you can post it for the group. We will. We'll be happy to do that, Suzanne. Can you give the title? We have uh, time for one or two more questions. Uh, uh, this has been uh, fascinating. Can you give the title uh, or number of the bill before Congress right now that you mentioned that has bipartisan support for civics education and uh, some in our audience want to write to encourage passage of that legislation? Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, it's called the Civics Secures Democracy Act. Civics Secures Democracy. And I think it has the same title in both the House and the Senate. And, and it's possible that Davy uh, might have the, the uh, bill numbers and could put them in. There she goes. She's amazing. She's right. giving you the HR number uh, already in the, uh, yeah. In, in the, the chat. chat. Okay, excellent. And uh, Time for one last question. Can you speak to how we might convince collegiate level administrators to take civics education seriously? Not only does funding continue to be directed at STEM, and but in the last two years, funding has also been taken away from civics education and funneled to politically uh, sexy, for one of a better term, topics that seem to miss the big picture of civics education. Yeah, it's a great point. We've talked uh, a good bit about how the role of higher education. One of the most important things that colleges and universities can do is those that teach teachers need to teach teachers how to teach civics. Um, this is not something that the PE teacher uh, oh. is going to be able to pick up and do, it, particularly in today's uh, divisive environment, mm -hmm. polarized environment. Teaching mm -hmm. civics can be a dangerous thing. Um, and teachers need to be empowered to do that. And then, yes, we need to teach. We, we need to acknowledge. We need to understand that kids are not arriving in college having had a good grounding in civics through elementary or, or high school. And so we do need to think about at, at the college level um, some fairly basic uh, classes in civics. We've mm -hmm. got to recognize that at all levels, um, because this has been going on for decades. We have a lack of civic literacy that is uh, dangerous uh, for, the, for the continuation of our democracy. Suzanne, I can't thank you enough for being with us this evening and uh, your bipartisan, nonpartisan approach to it uh, is refreshing and uh, encouraging. And uh, I just uh, continue to encourage you to do your good work and uh, thank you for taking time to be with us tonight and the kickoff to the series of programs that we're going to have on this. Uh, the next program uh, is already scheduled in our uh, Civics in American Democracy series. It's going to be Tuesday, March 1st at 7 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Professor Kimberly Shepley from uh, the Princeton University will be joining us to share her observations on how 
the independence of the judicial branches in other countries has been undermined uh, by uh, the other uh, uh, parts of the governments in certain countries. Uh, the other branches of the governments have uh, intentionally undermined the independence of the judiciary. So it's another eye-opening uh, and, and uh, uh, illuminating uh, lecture that we'll be having on March 1st. Registration will open then uh, next week on the Society's website for that. And we're working on scheduling a third lecture in this series with uh, Dean and former Judge David Levy of the Bolch Institute at Duke University. And that may occur between now and March. So stay tuned uh, for, for the update on that. The Society also hosts monthly virtual programs over the lunch hour, lunch hour on the East Coast, uh, late breakfast on the West Coast. Uh, the next program is January 31st at noon. Professor Christopher Brooks will be speaking on John Stuart Rock, the first African-American to become a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Registration is open for Professor Brooks' talk and available on the Society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org. A reminder that a survey will go out tomorrow morning to everyone who registered in advance. Please do respond to it. Uh, we want to make these programs as rich and accessible to as many people as possible. We thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Suzanne. It's good to be with you again, and we are adjourned. <laughs>